Oh, good. An episode starring Sea Spray, the Aquaman of the Autobots. 22 minutes of that perpetually gargling voice. I can't wait. We open with Bumblebee doing some kind of fancy water skiing, which is an obvious attempt to bait me into making a jump the shark joke. Sorry, too easy. Let's move on. After they're finished, this happens. Hey, look. The first star of the evening. What do you say we make a wish? So apparently they're on a date. Which, hey, I've covered this before. I'm not judging. But won't Spike get jealous? Meanwhile, on some other planet, man, that was an awkward transition, we see human slaves being whipped by robot overlords. Now you're talking. The planet in question is ruled by something called Deceptitran, which I can only assume is a robot version of Dr. Tran. He's a real doctor. Hey, I'm not entirely opposed to stale internet references. Deceptitran is some kind of fat tentacled robot monster thing who, in his own words, is programmed to ruin other people's lives. I know if I built a robot, I wouldn't mess around with all this helping mankind jargle. Life ruiner is totally the way to go. So the way things work on this planet is the indigenous humanoids are hooked up to machines that drain the energy out of them, which powers the machines that rule the planet. Which sounds an awful lot like some movie I saw once, but for the life of me, I can't remember which one. The inhabitants of this planet are water-based, which is fine. I'm sure there are amphibious mer people in space somewhere. But here's where they lose me. This evil overlord and his robotic army can't go into the water or they short out. Which, to my way of thinking, makes them fairly ineffectual as slave masters on a world of amphibious mer people. But to their credit, they don't give up. Deceptitran calls back to Megatron for instructions, and we begin to see the bigger picture the writers have been painting this season, beginning with The Gambler. Megatron is no longer just your standard world-conquering tyrant. Now he's some kind of deep space mobster with his metal fingers and all kinds of interplanetary pies. And you know, despite the fact that there are about seven or eight giant gaping holes in this premise, I actually kind of like it. It makes his constant failure on Earth a little more bearable when you factor in all his off-world ventures. So the Autobots intercept Deceptitran's signal and put together a force to check it out. Cosms comes up with some kind of lame excuse not to bring Optimus Prime along, which he buys, and it becomes clear to us that even his own guys can't wait for this guy to just die already. Deceptitran's guys shoot down Cosms, who crashes near something called the Well of Transformation. Oh god, now I remember this episode. During the inevitable fighting on the ground, a girl who looks and sounds almost exactly like Lady J from G.I. Joe, except, you know, she's a fish alien, jumps in to help, and Sea Spray gets all choked up around her. Somebody has ocean fever, I guess. Meanwhile, Megatron brings a couple of guys to visit Deceptitran. This is a nice slave operation you have here, he says. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it. So, Well of Transformation. The Well of Transformation dissolves the body, leaving only the essence which can then reform into whatever new body we choose. Um, alright, fine. You know, your body says science fiction, but your eyes say magic. You really need to pick one. Anyway, I'm sure you can see where this is going, but we're not even to the first commercial break yet, so we're going to have to sit and wait for it. The Autobots fall off a waterfall, and since they don't have Hound around with them this time, they actually have to succumb to the laws of gravity instead of just pretending. The group escapes and meets back up with their fishy friends, but they leave Bumblebee behind. Ah, three out of four is good enough, right? That's probably what Optimus Prime would say. The Decepticons capture the little guy, and the Autobot and People Alliance put together a plan to rescue him. It's those bastard rebels again! Did he just call them Bastard Rebels? I think he did. Sea Spray and Alana rescue Bumblebee, but fortunately Laserbeak was just sort of hanging out on a shelf in cassette mode and he springs into action. While he pursues, he finds something called the Secret of the Tulalacons. What's that, you ask? No time! Overcome by, I don't know, I guess we'll call it love, why not? Sea Spray jumps into the Well of Transformation and turns himself into a person. Hands up, who saw this coming? Uh, Alright, put your hands down, it was a rhetorical statement. Well, now Bumblebee's going to get really jealous. I actually don't have too much of a problem with wanting to close the species barrier a bit here, but couldn't you make her a robot instead? We have plenty of humanoids already, thanks. Actually, the show does back me up a little in my robots are better than humans stance, as Sea Spray realizes how weak and useless he is as a humanoid. And you know, he's already a mini-spy, so if he feels weak and useless now... Wow. Wait, though. If the Well of Transformation can turn you into anything you want, why don't these people turn themselves into giant robots, or monsters? Something that's better suited to fighting Decepticons. I mean, if my world were at peace and all I had to do was lounge around in the ocean all day, I might choose Merman occasionally myself. But during a violent robotic occupation of my home? Probably not my first choice. Anyway, they pass back through the well and Alana tricks Rumble into turning into a tree, which is actually pretty funny. Alana comes back around to my way of thinking and turns herself into a sexy lady robot. 
And I gotta tell you, between the tree trick and this, well, I'm, I'm getting a little spit in my own self here. Are you ready, Deceptitran? Ready, mistress. I am yours to command. Um, what's going on here? Oh, so apparently the fish people were the two lalacons. What does that mean exactly? Are they actually Decepticons? No time! So Alana and Seaspray realize they don't have to be the same on the outside to appreciate what's on the inside. Then they ride off into the sunset together, presumably to engage in some unspeakable crimes against nature. Score! And now it's time for this week's science lesson. When Seaspray first meets Alana, he blushes in embarrassment. This is caused by blood vessels, which robots totally have. Oh, oh no! My pink job's ruined! Oh. 